Are you committed? Now, we've heard a lot about commitment in recent sermons in the past and editorials and this and that, but I thought that this topic is important in light of what is going to happen in about a month from now. So those of us who are in the church, we made an important decision in our life to be a part of this church, to be a part of Christ, knowing that we must live differently than the rest of the world to be set apart from the world, which involves our commitment. Commitment is defined as a pledge or undertaking, an act of pledging or setting aside something, which is a dedication. So when we commit ourselves to doing something, we have to follow through, or else we would be considered dishonest and even unreliable. And once we say yes, we have to do it, unless circumstances are different and justified. You can always remember what Christ said, let your yes be your yes and your no's be your no. Do we have goals in life and are we committed to them? If there is something we are trying to pursue and are serious about, do we keep trying or will we give up as soon as we have started it? or soon after we have started. But we also go through trial and error, or if something is not working out the way we want it to, it may be God trying to tell us something. Perhaps he's teaching us a lesson. It may not even be in accordance to his will. But being successful involves hard work and commitment. You don't know unless you try. Living in this world is difficult. And living God's way of life is difficult because we are constantly bombarded with temptations and some could certainly be considered our greatest weaknesses, which we need to overcome by constantly having God involved in our lives. We commit ourselves to him by living his way of life. It's not about our way of life, but it is his way of life. So what important decisions did we have to make to show our commitment to his way of life? What is that commitment we, that we took? And pretty much most of us here and listening in went through our baptism. This was the important commitment that we had to make. We knew as soon as we made the commitment that our lives would be changed and that there would be no turning back. Our lives would become increasingly difficult, yet at the same time we would experience a change, that being a good change. We knew that we were filled with God's Holy Spirit the moment we were baptized. We were considered holy. We have God's special protection, and we grow in wisdom, and we grow in strength to bring us closer to God's master plan. We don't need to be afraid, and when we are in doubt, there are several scriptures we can turn to for reassurance, one of which is in Isaiah 41, Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not, dis- be, be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And verse 13, For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 6 tells us to be strong and of good courage. Do not fear, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. The book of Psalms has an abundance of encouraging scriptures. And one of them with which I'd like to turn to is in Psalms 103. Psalms 103 and verse 1. Read one, uh, verse 1 through 10. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, 
who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, he acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. See, so this just goes to show us how loving and merciful our Father in heaven is, and we shouldn't be afraid of what's going on in this world today, but be committed to God's way, and we can see what he promises us. There is, however, responsibility that we must endure because to live God's way of life, we must fear him. What we fear is breaking his commandments, breaking our commitment we have with God. Remember, we committed ourselves to him at our baptism. Let's also look at verses 11 through 14 of Psalm 103. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. We were committed to the truth as soon as we were baptized. Because we know these things, we have to ask ourselves, how committed are we to the truth and God's way of life? And this is a question we constantly ask ourselves every single year, too, especially right before Passover. Because we are baptized and we have to go through that examining period, which I would say we are doing now, should always be doing, but this is our crunch time month, as I like to call it. Uh, do we sometimes lack in faith? Now, last time I spoke, I talked about the very thing, the enemies of faith. And I'm touching upon that again because it is something we are going to go through anyway, continuously. But that is an important question. Do we sometimes lack in it? Do we have faith that God will protect us? And during the terrible times we are, will be going through, will God show mercy on us? When God gives us a command, will we comply or will we complain? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 6 through 10. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. So by faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And also in verse 17 and 18, the same chapter, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. So they all acted by faith, not knowing what was going to happen, not knowing what the reason was. And aren't we sometimes in that same situation? We have to be consistent with what God tells us. There is no picking, there's no choosing, I'm going to do this, but I'm not going to do that. It doesn't work that way. We can't agree with something that God says and then at the same time disagree with something else that God commands us. We do not want to be lukewarm, as we read in the third chapter of Revelation. 
We must listen to God's word, and we must take it to action. Since we're right there, Hebrews chapter 12, and verses 25 through 29. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of the things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Just as we have faith in God, God at the same time is faithful to forgive us when we ask for forgiveness, as we read about earlier, as we have read about earlier in Psalms 103. Unfortunately, in this world today, there isn't a whole lot of faith in God, but rather taking matters into their own hands, the human reasoning aspect. They may mean well and think that they are doing, or what they are doing is justified, but as soon as one goes against what God says by thinking they are doing the right thing, that is putting matters into their own hands. Many also teach these things thinking that they are teaching God's word, but they are not. God does not approve of that. We see that in 1 Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 3. I'll read verse 3 to 10. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which, accord, which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain, from such withdraw yourself. Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into the temptation and the snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all evils, for which some have strayed from the faith in their great or greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. This is what the world is all about today. We have to be careful that we don't fall victim to this type of thinking. But the next two verses, verses 11 and 12, makes it very clear as to what we are to do, which is quite the opposite of what we just read. Verse 11, But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. We know that we have to live or have to have a tremendous amount of faith to live this way. And it should be easy for us to do this because we know firsthand what the Bible promises and what is going to happen. So when we committed ourselves to God at our baptism, we should have known what we were getting ourselves into. Should have known. Hopefully we still do know. We have to be careful that we don't slip, that we don't lose focus, but stay committed at all times. Why do we have to do this at all times? Well, Christ's parable in Matthew 25 compares the church with five wise and five foolish virgins. And the lesson here 
is that we have to stay committed at all times, since we do not know when Christ will return. We have to watch what's going on at all times. We don't want to be asleep when that time is about is among us. Now, there are ways that commitment can be delayed. When it comes to the seriousness of God's plan, we cannot delay that. We can't be asleep. And don't we realize that Christ's coming may be delayed if those in the church who God wants to call into his kingdom are not ready due to lack of serious repentance? We do know that. It's in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 7 and 9. Or 7 to 9. So we should all realize the importance of our individual commitment we have with God and with each other. Christ said to his church in John chapter 15, verse 12, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I loved you. So it's not just loving God, but it's also loving each and every one of us. So when one of us suffers, we're all there for that person. We all pray together. And look at the power of prayer. Look what it has done to people that were in serious trouble. And we still have that. There are many among us who are struggling that need prayers, and we can expect that to happen. These are the trials that we are going through, and everybody has different types of trials that we go through. But it's all for the same reason. So as we have heard today, our decision we made to be baptized is a crucial necessity if we want to be in God's kingdom by receiving God's Holy Spirit so we can receive everlasting life. Now, we're going to hear a lot about the Holy Spirit in the upcoming message, so I'm not going to go into that right now. Now, I'll let, I'll let uh, Mr. Link do that. But this is always going to be perceived as a mystery in this world until Christ returns. But we, the church, have been given the gift to understand this now. The question is, again, are we committed? Thank you.